best we can. Moving in. Good morning. Ah, good morning, folks. Um, I'm uh, Jane Harmon, director and president and CEO of the Wilson Center. And uh, I want to especially welcome the chairman of the board, our board, my boss, Ambassador Joe Gildenhorn, member of the, and the members of the Wilson Council and Alliances. It's an honor to co-host this event with the Aspen Institute. Uh, and to welcome ambassadors from Bulgaria, Canada, Costa Rica, the Czech Republic, Fiji, and the League of Arab States, and maybe others. Um, unlike the Washington Monument or the Lincoln Memorial, the Wilson Center is a living memorial to our 28th president, our only PhD president, did you know, uh, who studied Congress as his PhD subject. Um, this center was chartered by Congress in 1968, and we claim to offer a safe political space for independent research and open dialogue that leads to actionable ideas for the broad policy community. That also happens to be the goal of the Aspen Institute's Homeland Security Advisory Group, uh, which I and former Secretary of Homeland Security Michael Chertoff co-chair. We are a bipartisan group of homeland security and counterterrorism experts, some of whom are within eyesight, uh, who meet periodically, including this morning, to discuss issues and problems in depth and make recommendations to the current secretary, who happens to be sitting right here. Uh, as a former nine-term congresswoman, I served on all the major security committees in the House, intelligence, armed services, homeland security, and I am passionate about these issues. And for the two years I have been at the Wilson Center, we have held programs and hosted major national conversations on the toughest of these issues. For example, uh, in April uh, of 2012, John Brennan asked to speak here to describe the legal limitations around the Obama administration's drone program. The very thoughtful public discussion we had that day may have helped generate the administration's soon-to-be-published counterterrorism playbook. We also hosted a national conversation last fall with cyber czar Keith Alexander, Senator Susan Collins, and Anthony Romero, who's the head of the ACLU, on how to bring the public into the very difficult discussion on cyber. Uh, we addressed a range of issues, and we'll cover some of this again today, from privacy uh, to the role of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, all of the participants in that national conversation shared the view, and I know our secretary does too, that cyber attacks pose a potential catastrophic threat to U.S. infrastructure. Uh, I met Janet Napolitano long ago. <laughs> she knows what's coming. When she was a young associate in a Phoenix law firm. She claims that she had a perm. <laughs> I did. But I have no memory. <laughs> Since then, she has been U.S. Attorney, Attorney General of Arizona, Governor of Arizona, the first woman to chair the National Governors Association. Obviously, I had a great influence over her. Absolutely. <laughs> and we worked closely together when I chaired the House Homeland Intelligence Subcommittee, and she made one of her first uh, field visits as Homeland Secretary to the Port of Los Angeles which is the nation's largest container port. The topics uh, I will discuss with her uh, for part of this uh, uh, morning, uh, including cyber, immigration, terrorism, and, and uh, disasters, uh, all impact the Port of LA and other critical infrastructure throughout the country. Uh, leading DHS is a nearly impossible job because its jurisdiction merges 22 agencies and departments, its organization does not parallel the committee structure in Congress, and the threats against our country keep morphing, to name just a few of the modest issues that confront uh, ja Janet Napolitano every day. And yet she soldiers on and has made significant progress. Special kudos, my friend, 
uh, to you and your department for the extraordinary performance during and after Superstorm Sandy. Uh, what a sea change, no pun intended, <laughs> from the response to Katrina. Uh, before engaging in the conversation, let me say a word about one other person who is supposed to be here. I'm not sure that she's here. Is Carrie Lamack here? Ah, yes. Um, I want to make uh, do a special shout out for Carrie, whose mother was killed on 9-11, and whose voice and courage have inspired Congress and me and the executive branch, both in the Bush administration and the Obama administration, to act. She is the director of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Homeland Security Project, and her movie, Killing in the Name, did an extraordinary amount to expose the fact that much of Al-Qaeda's horror is against innocent Muslims. There are lots of big shots in this room, and one of them, a great favorite of mine, Bill Webster, just uh, walked in. But weighing in at 100 pounds, Kerry may actually be the heavyweight. So welcome, Kerry. Welcome to all of you, and welcome to Janet Napolitano. Now, are, are you embarrassed? Oh, good. <laughs> that was my intention. Okay, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, let's start with cyber. Yeah. You've said that a cyber 9-11 is not an if, but a when. What would a cyber 9-11 look like, and how soon could it happen? It could happen uh, imminently. Uh, what would it look like? It could take many forms, but uh, let me just give one that may come to mind, which is uh, what happens when the electric grid goes down. You know, we saw that during Sandy, and you see how that impacts everything from the ability to uh, heat uh, homes to the ability to pump gasoline to the ability to have lighting at night, everything. So uh, when we look at the nation's critical infrastructure, and uh, where it is vulnerable, one of the vulnerabilities is through the cyber and the networked cyber world that we live in. Uh, so uh, we have been, you know, kind of trying to get this word out. Uh, the Secretary of Defense has, I have, the Attorney General has, the Chair of the Joint Chiefs has, saying, look, uh, we, we shouldn't wait till there is a 9-11 in the cyber world. There are things we can and should be doing right now uh, that, if not prevent, would mitigate the, the extent of damage that could be caused. Well, as most people in this audience know, uh, legislation is pending in Congress, several versions, but it's stalled. I know we're all shocked to hear that it's stalled. Um, so far as I know, the White House will soon release an executive order to add authorities that don't exist, but what in, in a perfect world, uh, what authorities do we not have? What authorities does DHS need? And, and what role uh, is and should DHS play in keeping our, our uh, com country safe from a catastrophic cyber attack? You know, uh, cyber is, is one of the areas where I think the department has evolved the most in the last few years. Uh, now we have a 24-7 watch center. We have a significant population of workers who are expert in this field. We have agreements with the Department of Defense and the NSA on how we uh, can utilize their technical uh, expertise. Um, really in the cyber world, uh, myself, Bob Mueller, the head of the FBI, and Keith Alexander, General Alexander, the head of the NSA, have worked very closely together uh, to uh, d develop playbooks and to really ascertain who has what roles and what responsibilities uh, uh, in different types of scenarios. Nonetheless, uh, what we know in civilian space is that our ability to uh, detect, prevent, and mitigate is assisted materially uh, based on whether we know something has occurred. So uh, the idea of sharing and getting notice, particularly when the infiltrated uh, entity is part of the nation's critical infrastructure that everybody else relies upon. Uh, is key. Um, the ability to uh, uh, be able to uh, undertake certain mitigation measures is key. Uh, the ability to uh, have the freedom to hire uh, personnel to the department uh, without some of the restrictions of the civil service system, uh, key, because <coughs> these are employees that everybody is competing for. Uh, so uh, legislation uh, would have the uh, 
uh, effect of uh, clarifying, uh, making sure those roles and responsibilities are set forth in statute. Uh, FISMA reform should be included. Uh, and then dealing with Why some of the Why don't you explain what uh, FISMA is? Well, uh, uh, I'm going to let you explain what FISMA is. Go, go finish your sentence. Then. That's, that's a, yeah. That is a, a concept I'm not sure everybody's familiar with. Anyway, so uh, an executive order can do so much. Uh, the um, legislation is going to be critical. And it's one of those areas where uh, part of our job is to educate the Congress on uh, what is going on out there. Educate the public. We say cyber and everybody's eyes glaze over. I can see it. I can see it in some of you. Uh, uh, and, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the clarion call is here. Uh, we need to be dealing with this very urgently and imminently because uh, attacks are coming all the time. They're coming from different sources. They take different forms. Uh, but uh, they are increasing in seriousness and sophistication. Well, you mentioned civilian space, and I don't know how, how well everyone understands the fact that there is uh, defense space, that's the dot .mil space, there's government space, that's dot .gov, but then there's dot .com and dot .org. That's the civilian space, and that's the, the overwhelming majority of space, and a lot of our infrastructure is operated by the private sector, so that piece of this puzzle has to be in. And, um, you, Homeland has uh, jurisdiction uniquely where the Pentagon doesn't. That's right. Or, or the NRO doesn't over this civilian space. And, and, and that is a reason, uh, maybe not well enough understood, why Homeland has to be a major player. And yet, uh, many in the private sector, some of the business interests, uh, have been saying that Homeland does not have the competence to do this job well. Do you agree with that? No. Uh, I think that's what they call that a, uh, that's what's called a leading question. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, one of the things we deal with all the time at, at DHS is perception doesn't match reality, and so uh, perception uh, is of how things were, you know, five years ago, seven years ago, and the like. Uh, uh, perception needs to catch up with reality, uh, because in point of fact, the department has uh, moved light years ahead in terms of its cyber capabilities, and we continue to move in that direction. And President Obama has continued to ask Congress for the resources that we need in order to do that. Uh, so when we talk about the interaction with the private sector, which we do in a number of other areas already, um, what we're talking about is l linking together the, the private sector, that, <coughs> that part of it which controls our core critical infrastructure uh, with our overall statutory responsibility to help protect the nation's uh, infrastructure. Um, and when we talk about linking those things together from a security perspective, uh, we're not talking about a regulatory overlay. What we're talking about is how do you take uh, part of our country that is uh, infrastructure uh, that everybody has to depend on and make sure that we have our security interests, the public good, taken into account? Well, I obviously agree. Mm -hmm. Changing the subject uh, to a, an uncontroversial subject like immigration. Yeah. Uh, President Obama said on Monday, quote, our journey is not complete until we find a better way to welcome the striving, hopeful immigrants who still see America as a land of opportunity, until bright young students and engineers are enlisted in our workforce rather than expelled from our country. Uh, you were governor of, of Arizona when the uh, Bush 43 administration bipartisan comprehensive immigration bill failed. Uh, are we ready for another moment where we could pass such a thing? Do we still need a bill like that? And, and what efforts will you and your department make to try to help this president uh, put immigration reform back, on the, uh, back at the top of the agenda? Well, I, I think the president's very clear that immigration needs to move forward. And it's one of those areas where uh, you know, the business interests and faith-based interests and advocacy groups and uh, others now clearly recognize that the system we have uh, doesn't match uh, the needs that we have as an immigrant country. Uh, so uh, we need to do uh, a couple of things. Uh, most importantly, we need to uh, reform the way uh, people can become citizens of the country. Uh, we need to reform our visa system. 
Uh, we need to deal realistically and practically with those already in the country. Um, and quite frankly, uh, one of the straw man arguments I now hear is, well, we can't deal with immigration until we, quote, secure the border, right? You've heard that phrase. Well, the plain fact of the matter is, is that border numbers haven't been as low since the early 1970s. Um, we've really changed uh, the a that aspect of the border. More manpower, more technology. We now have air cover across the entire border. Uh, uh, we're getting to the point of diminishing marginal returns. Uh, what would really help us is if we could uh, improve the legal migration system so that people come through our ports of entry. We know who they are. We know where they're going. Uh, if necessary, we know how long they're entitled to stay. Um, so uh, we shouldn't take these things as a sequentially. They go together. They are interlinked. Um, and do you think will, that the president will be able to make progress on this, uh, uh, the legislation in this first year of his second term? Well, I think, uh, uh, I think there is great bipartisan discussion already occurring in the Congress in both houses on immigration. Uh, so this may actually be one of those big issues that the Congress can take up and recognize it's for the good of the country as a whole and, and try to get out of the uh, kind of partisan gridlock in which it has been found the last uh, last decade, really. Yeah. Well, I don't want to out him, but Steve Hadley is about four rows back, and uh, he remembers, uh, I'm sure, the disappointment when that bill failed. Uh, Michael Chertoff, your predecessor, was one, one of the point persons on it and had to go sit in his cabin by himself for the weekend after it failed. He was so discouraged. Um, but it's a big deal, and it right. affects uh, our whole country, and uh, certainly I'm, I'm personally hopeful that we, that we make real progress. Uh, last immigration question. You've been working with the Mexican government on creating a 21st century border right. between the U.S. and Mexico, uh, one that's based on risk segmentation and the application of the latest technology. Uh, please update us on how that's going. That's going well. Uh, you know, Mexico is one of our leading uh, trading partners. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, we need a port infrastructure that allows goods and commerce to flow smoothly through. Uh, we're working on uh, projects like pre-inspection, so trying to take pressure off the physical uh, border and do things before goods get there. We're working uh, with Mexico on trusted shipper and trusted traveler uh, programs. We're working on doing risk-based analysis of cargo. Uh, before it even arrives at a port of entry. So uh, I think that border, which is the most frequently uh, traversed border in the world, uh, really can serve and will serve uh, as a model for how you manage a, a long, complicated, complex border to the economic advantage of both sides. Well, we also have those issues along the Canadian border, and we have it them at our ports. Uh, one of the things I'm proud of uh, from my service in Congress, which I did with uh, former Representative uh, Dan Lundgren, bipartisan bill, was the Safe Ports Act, right. which had the same idea, layered security as far out as possible. At the right. point of embarkation, uh, we checked what was in containers, and then they were secured so that they couldn't be tampered with on the high seas. So by the time they got here, there wouldn't be a slowdown in letting <coughs> commerce uh, travel through the U.S. because our ports are big feeders of uh, of economic, uh, our economic well-being. Oh, uh, sure, well -being. the Port of Los Angeles. Just look at the ripple effects when uh, the cargo stops moving at that port. It ripples through the whole country. One of the things, though, it, you raise a good point. Our, our department's name is Homeland Security, but in point of fact, a lot of our work needs to be done internationally and is done internationally. We now have uh, folks in 75 countries around the world uh, we are negotiating agreements all the time with other countries on how we do these things, how we make agreements for how cargo will be handled and sealed and inspected, uh, how we make agreements on how passengers can, can come. All of those things, I think, creates an international security net in a way uh, that enables us to uh, look forward to, I think, greater ease in the commercial side and on uh, the travel side than we've ever had before. Well, that's uh, obviously urgent, given some of the threats that have almost been pulled off against our country right. uh, by people with bombs in their shoes and uh, uh, et cetera, <coughs> right. uh, and bombs in other body parts, uh, and making sure we know, and we haven't done it perfectly, uh, who's boarding our airplanes and that we have a net to catch them even prior to that. 
is, is critical. I want to stay on the subject of, of uh, terrorism and counterterrorism. Um, there's a lot of unrest in Mali. Everyone's reading the newspapers, and obviously in Algeria, too. Why do those events affect your department and your jurisdiction? Well, uh, when you think about the world today, you know, we have, we're in the post-Arab Spring world. Uh, we have uh, situations. Not sure it's post. Uh, Where Arab they? Spring into summer, maybe. Uh, uh, but the, uh, the developments there, the developments across North Africa uh, have huge implications for the United States. Um, just to give you one example, uh, anytime you have areas where there is no rule of law and where there is no uh, government, uh, you have a place, nature abhorring a vacuum, uh, where Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda-type affiliates can take root. Uh, and as uh, we have those places, uh, they seed things. They seed things on the Internet. They seed uh, uh, plots that can come into Western Europe. Uh, they contemplate plots against the United States. And just because we haven't had a major terrorist attack in the homeland uh, in the last few years does not mean uh, that uh, we can seal ourselves off from the risk of such an attack. So uh, we live in a world where what happens in North Africa and countries that people may not even have heard of uh, before uh, really can have a direct impact whether you, know, you live in Washington, D.C. or Los Angeles or any place in between. And the flip side of that is we also have homegrown terrorists right. and so-called lone wolves. Those are people who don't act in, in consort with others. Uh, but when we're dealing with American citizens inside our country, uh, there is a, a different grid that applies. There is our Constitution and our Fourth Amendment, and a subject that vexed me enormously in Congress. Right. Couldn't get very far, and I know it's one that you think about, too, uh, is where that line is between freedom of expression, which is protected by our First Amendment, and that means freedom to express views that probably none of us in this room would approve of. That's protected. And then there's a line, and then it is uh, expression of views that, that cause violent behavior, I mean, right. actions that, that are violent, which are not protected. Interceding at that line is, is the hard part. So what's the answer? Um, I think one of the, the advances we have made uh, is to take the concept of homeland security and recognize that through better information sharing and training, uh, we can actually empower state and local law enforcement uh, really to be eyes and ears on the ground. Uh, we've created a network of fusion centers to help us with that information sharing. Uh, we've created a whole training curricula. And we are looking at past cases of homegrown violence uh, to uh, educate us about, okay, what were the early indicators and behaviors? Uh, what did we see with, say, for example, Breivik, uh, he, Norway, uh, you remember that attack? Uh, there are lessons to be learned there. Uh, there are lessons to be learned from Aurora, Colorado. There are lessons to be learned from uh, the attack in Newtown. There are lessons to be learned uh, through all of these events. And the <coughs> lessons are, uh, what are the early indicators, behaviors, clues that someone is moving beyond uh, a free speech issue into actually wanting to commit an act of violence. It is an art. It is not a science. Mm -hmm. uh, and it requires judgment because we're very cognizant of privacy and civil liberties and, and the rest. Uh, but uh, I, I think we have and are in the process of creating a much better weaving together of state and local law enforcement with what we can do at the federal level. And I agree with that and would just point out that uh, under the 2004 intelligence reform law, which grew out of many of the failures on 9-11 and passed because Carrie Lamack and her 100-pound body were strongly behind it, uh, we created a Privacy and Civil Liberties Commission. Uh, that's in the law. It's taken forever to, to get people appointed, and it still is not fully functioning, but actually it finally has members. 
The point of that exercise was at the front end of policymaking to make sure that we factor in privacy and civil liberties considerations as we come up with appropriately tough security measures. I, right. I've always said it's not a zero-sum game. You either get more of both or less of both. Right, and you've got to do, you, you really, you, you nailed it because you have to think about privacy issues at the beginning. Uh, they're not an afterthought. At DHS, I think we were the first department uh, in the Obama administration to actually have a presidentially appointed privacy officer. We actually have a large privacy office. Uh, and they're at the table, uh, and they are helping us. Uh, you know, it's very <coughs> uh, practical stuff. Uh, if we collect information, what kind can we collect? How can we store it? Who can we share it with? Mm -hmm. How long? Uh, for what purpose can it be used? Uh, though there are privacy implications uh, about that. A uh, number of other examples of how we embed privacy considerations into the work that we do. And how important it is. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, our country is strong because we protect civil liberties and we protect security, not because we protect one of them and not the other one. These are our values, that's correct. Right. Final question. Um, you and I are both in a field dominated by men. Um, as I mentioned, I served on all the major security committees in the Congress, and I now serve on the uh, State Department, Pentagon, CIA, and DNI external boards. You are the first Secretary of Homeland Security who happens to be a woman. What advice do you have to young women who are thinking about getting into the security field? Get at it. Uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating. It's important. Uh, it's uh, challenging. Uh, and you can serve the public in a, in a, in a way that you can't serve in uh, any other regard. So I would just say get at it. Here, here. Anyone disagree with that? If so, leave the room. <laughs> uh, we're now turning to uh, questions from you. Please identify yourselves. Wait for the mic. There are some in an overflow room, and so we'll take some of those uh, in writing. I think that's how this is going to work. We have uh, about... Uh, Tw a full 20 minutes. I just do want to mention, because I see most of them here, and I'm afraid I won't introduce them if I, if I don't read the whole list, uh, but there are members of our advisory group in the room, including or most of these people in the room, Charlie Allen, Stuart Baker, Richard Benvenisti, um, uh, Jim Carafano, P.J. Crowley, Fearless Clark Irvin, who directs our group, whom I forgot to acknowledge, uh, Steve Hadley, uh, I don't think Walter Isaacson is here, Brian Michael Jenkins, Mike Leiter, these are all names you know, former Congressman Paul McHale, John McLaughlin, Phil Mudd, uh, Ozzie Nelson, Eric Olson, uh, Dan uh, Prieto, uh, Guy Swan, Bill Webster I mentioned, Evan Wolf, Juan Zarate, and Phil Zellico. It's an amazing list, and you know it, it is a tribute to you, my friend, yeah. because uh, all these people care intensely about our homeland security, but they also value uh, the opportunity to help advise. That's great. Questions. Um, right here, red jacket. Please identify yourself. Hi, Rachel Oswald, Global Security Newswire. Uh, Secretary, can you tell us how close your department is to meeting uh, Congress's mandate that 100% of foreign cargo be scanned um, when it comes into the country? Um, you're operating the, under an extension now that's due up, I believe, to close in summer 2014, and also could you tell us about any projects the DNDO office is working on, any new nuclear detection technology? Uh, with respect to 100% scanning, I actually looked into this issue very thoroughly, uh, as did my predecessor, uh, Secretary Chertoff. Uh, it's one of those things where as we have grown and become more knowledgeable about how to really manage risk, uh, we have recognized that mandates like that uh, sound very good, but in point of fact, uh, are extraordinarily expensive and that there are better and more efficient ways to accomplish the same result. Uh, so we have uh, a number of things around the world. That's why I mentioned the negotiation of international agreements and the like. Uh, those are the kinds of things uh, that uh, layered together uh, make it, uh, make us confident that we are doing what all that can be done uh, to minimize the risk that dangerous cargo uh, will enter the United States. Uh, and with respect to DNDO, one of their achievements last year, and it's a significant one, uh, was uh, to uh, 
finally implement or finish and begin implementing a nuclear architecture uh, for the safety of the country. And I, I don't want to go into some of the new technologies because um, uh, we don't want to share some of that information, but uh, there's constantly developing technology in that arena. Right here. Wait, uh, wait for the I'm, microphone. I'm Ami Hober. I'm a consultant in the national security arena. There was an editorial the other day on the TSA pre-program that argued that it was unequal and therefore should be abolished. Those of us who spend our lives on airplanes appreciate it a lot. Does this sort of argument threaten the program? No, in fact, um, I mean, I appreciate that, but here's the thing. Uh, I just talked about managing risk. Uh, one of the big developments in the department over the last few years is to say, well, well, we don't need to treat all cargo the same. We don't need to treat every passenger the same. Uh, we did as we got started. That was the only thing to do. But now we can begin uh, really looking at uh, risk or travelers we need to know more about uh, versus those that have already given us information. Um, so as we have been able uh, technologically to link systems with the airlines, uh, as we've been able to uh, uh, have airports install the right types of equipment, uh, you have seen the pre-check program, the, the domestic program, uh, already expand. I think the number I recently had was about 8% of passengers now are in it. Uh, our goal is <coughs> to get to half of passengers having some kind of uh, pre-check capability within the next two years. So uh, I think that really deals with the, the, the argument about being unequal. And we're sensitive to that argument, but our goal from a security standpoint is uh, to try to take uh, pressure off the line so we can focus on those we, we need to know more about. In the front row. My name is Petr Kandalovic. I'm the Czech ambassador, Madam Secretary. Uh, uh, how do you see the future of the legislation in the area of cybersecurity, and how can you uh, get around with the presidential executive order only? Well, the executive order will help on, on some things, uh, clarifying roles and responsibilities in some respects uh, by way of example, uh, setting forth uh, how we interact with the private sector by others, but it cannot create uh, any kind of overreaching statutory authority. Uh, it can't uh, also, it, it, it cannot also amend uh, current statute to better uh, equip us to deal with the cyber threat. So the EO can go so far, the executive order can go so far, but Congress will need to act. Uh, so I was pleased to see that uh, there was a placeholder bill uh, introduced yesterday. Uh, I think this is an area that the more Congress understands, the more willing they are to uh, really take this up. I think this is an interest of the new chair of the House Homeland Security Committee who worked on a bill last year. So uh, my hope uh, and my efforts will be toward moving legislation this year. Don, in the back. Thank you. Madam Secretary, I'm Don Wolfensberger with the Wilson Center. Uh, I was, I'm wondering whether you might give us a brief explanation of what prompted the withdrawal of the full body scanners at airports and when we might expect a replacement. Uh, full disclosure, I'm an arti hip, artificial hip guy, so I appreciate them. <laughs> well, we're not withdrawing all the scanners. We're withdrawing one type of scanner. Those scanners are very valuable. Why? Because aviation remains a threat. We don't put scanners in airports for our health. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, or because it's, you know, we want to interfere with travelers uh, going through airports. That's not their purpose. Their purpose is to deal with a, a, a known threat. And what's the known threat? The threat is that our adversaries, Al Qaeda and its affiliates, remain focused <coughs> on aviation, be it cargo or passenger, and uh, are increasingly sophisticated uh, about the types of things they want to do. So the scanners, which better enable us to see non-metallic explosive material uh, are essential. Now, uh, there was a privacy concern raised with one type of scanner because uh, it had like a smudged photographic image uh, as opposed to what Congress now requires is a software that just gives you like a stick figure that uh, then points out some anomalies. Uh, one type of scanner was able to get that software in. Uh, the other type 
has been unable to do that. Uh, they've been unable to meet that requirement. So we are uh, uh, removing those. Uh, actually, the company that manufactures them is removing them at their expense. Uh, and we will substitute in the, the other models. So the scanners will still be in the airports. Over there, in the back. Right here, with your hand way up, right there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Ted Alden from the Council on Foreign Relations. I wanted to ask you when we might see from uh, DHS some additional releases of data that would be very helpful in the coming immigration reform uh, debate. I'll give two specific examples. One is visa overstay rates, which would help mm -hmm. uh, for those in Congress mm -hmm. who want to move forward in expanding the visa waiver program, and would also help <coughs> counter the, the very common perception in Congress that visa overstay remains a massive problem, a big invulnerability, a real weakness in, in border security. The second would be some data on the effectiveness of the consequence programs at the border. I mean, we're now, you know, most of the, the people that, that are being apprehended by the Border Patrol now are going through some kind of consequence programs. That's right. Are these effective in reducing recidivism and preventing people from trying again, which has been a problem for so many years? These are pieces of data that would be very helpful in the debate, and I think a lot of that is probably available at this moment to DHS. Right. Uh, uh, and, and we are preparing some of that data in, uh, in the likelihood that uh, comprehensive immigration reform comes, comes up. So visa overstay rates. And what we have done to go back now and to identify uh, visa overstays uh, in the last 18 months is significant. I mean, one of the things we have discovered is a lot of individuals who were so-called visa overstays actually had left the country. Uh, we just didn't have a good record of that. So uh, one of the other things we're adding is a, a very enhanced uh, biographic type of exit system, which will be <coughs> implemented over the next uh, years, uh, that will give us a better sense of who's actually leaving. Uh, and, and with respect to uh, consequence delivery, you're absolutely right. Uh, we're past the time when uh, we just do turnaways uh, at, at the border. Uh, if you're found, you, you go into, we have some different models of consequence uh, uh, along the border. Uh, but we're keeping track of that, in, in particular for recidivism rates. And so uh, our consequence delivery uh, program, I, I think we'll have data available for the CIR debate. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, one of the things we need to do is, is educate members about what really is happening on immigration and at the border. Again, the perception and the reality are two different things. The woman in the back by the window. Hi, uh, my name is Lina Lee, and I'm an intern here at, at, uh, with the Wilson Center. And um, I have a question uh, regarding the drone attacks, uh, because um, the targeted killing of our, our, our lucky uh, just to raise a lot of questions. Uh, one of them is about the due process, uh, a due process uh, in mm -hmm. the uh, Constitution. Uh, President Obama has stressed <laughs> that uh, due process does not equal to uh, legal process, but we know that it won't last long. So um, I wonder uh, what kind of um, like legislation the Congress is working on uh, and do you think there will be a change in the first year of the second term of President Obama? Thank you. On the drone, on drones? Uh, on, on drones? Oh, I mean, on the uh, targeted killing oh. of uh, U.S. citizens specifically? Um, I think that uh, uh, what we have done is to uh, use a technology uh, now available uh, to uh, focus on and target those who are seeking to do harm to the United States. Uh, there is a legal infrastructure around it within the federal uh, executive branch. Uh, I think that uh, there will be uh, some further iteration of that as we go through this, this next year. Uh, that's been worked in the, the what they call the interagency. Uh, but uh, le let's not forget that uh, Alaki was really one of the key perpetrators of uh, fomenting an attack against the United States. I, let me, if I might, just add something there uh, as a former member of Congress. Um, I mentioned in my opening remarks that John Brennan came here to explain that there is a legal framework around drone attacks. Right. I also mentioned that the administration, I think probably led by him, is developing what's called a counterterrorism playbook, which That's is right. going to be more specific about what this framework is. I'm aware, and I think we are all aware, that 
some in Congress want to see the legal memoranda that have been prepared by the Obama Justice Department explaining the, the policy around um, uh, targeting American citizens abroad. It's a, it's a careful policy, but nonetheless explaining it. And Congress wants to see the memos. I personally think as a former member of Congress that in a classified setting those memos should be made available to Congress. And Congress <coughs> as an independent branch of government should be able to review them. And there ought to be a public discussion of not, not all the details, not the targeting set, but of, of the general subject. And so I, I think I, I'm pleased that you raised it. I, you know, it's the kind of thing the Wilson Center does. We want to have conversations around tough security issues. And uh, this is, a, I appreciate the fact that you, an intern at the Wilson Center, raised the subject. So thank you very much. It wasn't a planet question. Okay. <laughs> uh, other questions, right here. Thank you, Madam, Madam Secretary. Good morning, and good, good morning, morning, Ms. Harmon. I'm the ambassador of Costa Rica, and um, as you know, our country is doing well on the security front and on the economic front, but uh, we're trying to fight with institutions, which, what a lot of other countries fight with armed forces, and we have no armed forces. And we're in a dangerous neighborhood, uh, we're in the conduit to the U.S. drug market, starting with Colombia, Venezuela, and then going up through mm -hmm. Mexico. And the world is becoming terribly complicated with organized crime, terrorism, and drug trafficking all interlinked. Um, your department, and I would like to thank you, uh, is working very hard with us, and I appreciate it a great deal. I just want your assessment on progress made. Are you optimistic? Uh, realistically deflated, or how do you feel things are going and, and will go in the future? Um, in, in my judgment, we need to have a, a Western Hemisphere regional approach uh, with respect to Central <coughs> America. Uh, you know, you read in the press about violence rates in Mexico, and point of fact, the violence rates in uh, places like Honduras are, are much higher and are among the highest in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're right, the, the drug route comes right through there. Uh, I actually think this is an area where the United States and Mexico can and should work together uh, with Central America in terms of uh, uh, trying to uh, strengthen institutions, do capacity building, and uh, try to shut that drug network down. Um, Jan. I'm Jan Smith Donaldson on the Wilson Council. My question is, you keep warning of cyber 9-11. What can we as individuals do to be better prepared in the event of this? Well, I think uh, one of the things uh, every individual can do, I mean, every individual who's on the net is a, vul is a potential uh, 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 opening. Uh, and let's, you know, the internet is a great thing. Uh, this has em empowered the world. It makes knowledge available. It's, it's, a, f it's a phenomenon. Uh, we just want to make sure that it remains safe and free. Uh, so that requires everyone to take some responsibility, have good cyber habits, uh, uh, make sure you, we, we use the phrase stop, think, connect. Uh, we're actually trying to push that into young kids uh, who, uh, they're, on, uh, they're on the net, you know, at an ever younger age. Uh, so uh, I think with respect to your question, uh, every individual practicing what we, uh, good cyber hygiene. Uh, in, in my uh, judgment, if we could make it as uh, ordinary as making sure you buckle your seatbelt when you get in a car, uh, there are things you do before you get on the net, uh, that would be a significant advance. But a, a difference is that the technology is changing um, exponentially, hourly. And That's it is correct. very hard to think ahead of these things, which is why one of the things that Janet Napolitano said, which is the ability to recruit really smart people, especially kids who have integrated brains that people like me don't have, who can think ahead of the bad guys, is, is, is crucial. That's right. So if any of them are watching this, uh, first go to class. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, uh, secondly, uh, uh, what we have found in our recruitment efforts is the work itself is such a value. Um, and being able to participate in the security of the nation, that's a big deal. So 
uh, I think that you know we encourage young people to keep that in mind. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. I'm going to take two more questions. I then I'm inviting anyone from our advisory group in case you have a question or an observation briefly, and then uh, the secretary will be able to wrap up. So the two questions are going to be Stape Roy right there and in the very back by the window. Uh, Stapleton Roy with the uh, Wilson Center. Uh, Madam Secretary, I think you've correctly highlighted the uh, cyber threat. Uh, we have crime threats in our streets, but we have policemen out there who arrest criminals and prosecute them and send them to jail. Uh, in the cyber field, we're constantly told about the threat, but we, people who are victims of the threat, and we get viruses and attacks on our computers all the time, we don't see any visible evidence of the people who are going after the perpetrators. Uh, some of the threats come from misguided domestic people. Some come from foreign sources or from foreign governments. Is our legal framework, do we need international agreements on what's permissible and what's not permissible in terms of what governments should and shouldn't be doing? And why can't we have, there's no 911 number to send infected th things off to where somebody's responsible for going after the perpetrators. My sense is we need a more public evidence that there's an agency in the government that is addressing these problems. Could you address this problem? Because I constantly hear about threats and I don't see any visible evidence of who's going after the threats and who's dealing with them. Yeah, who's going after the threats? It's, it is, um, it, it, it is uh, the FBI, it's the Secret Service, it's uh, Homeland Security investigations under ICE, uh, it's state authorities in some respects, U.S. attorneys in, in some respects. Um, but the point you make about uh, the international framework and the global nature uh, of these things is so very, very important. So I think you're exactly right. Um, uh, we do not have an adequate international framework uh, for dealing with mm -hmm. some of this. There have been attempts, there are some things going on right now, uh, but in terms of really the world coming together and uh, reaching agreement on some conventions to be used where the internet is concerned, we're, we're not there. Uh, the idea of an internet 911 uh, kind of call thing, that's a neat idea. Um, I hadn't thought about that, and that would be something that I think our shop would take into account. So um, I think I'm gonna take that back. In the back of the room. Madam Secretary, uh, you brought up the new chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee. He has said that one of his uh, plans is to fix DHS. Wondering if you think that DHS needs to be fixed and are you worried about at all about having to work with a new Congress and a new chairman? Yeah, I've met with the new chairman. I, I think what he means by that is we want to continue to uh, integrate, to unite, to improve, uh, uh, to really uh, drive some of the issues we discussed this morning uh, forward, uh, be it cybersecurity, be it a real immigration system that matches our current needs, be it uh, counterterrorism and all of its morphing forms, international and domestic. Uh, and so I think, you know, we look forward to working with him and with the new chair of the Senate committee uh, to keep on moving these things forward. When you think about the major issues that are uh, in discussion in the country, there, there are the fiscal issues, um, but then you get to immigration reform, you get to cybersecurity, uh, you get to gun violence and what we do about that. Those are all in the wheelhouse of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so uh, we're going to be in the middle of the national dialogue on those three critical issues. And we'll work with the Congress on those. We'll work uh, with the public on those uh, because they're critical. One thing to add there is that uh, an unfinished piece of business from the 9-11 Commission was a call to Congress to reorganize itself right. to uh, uh, mirror the reorganization that's gone on at the Homeland Department. Well, Congress hasn't done that, and so what you're not hearing yet is uh, the need to continue to uh, report to, I think it's 88 committees and subcommittees, or maybe it's higher? 105. 105. <laughs> Yo. Um, would anyone who is a member of our advisory committee like to make a comment or at this point? I warned you all. Are you all tongue-tied? Uh, let me just see. Yes, right here. 
I'm Mike Groman with uh, ExxonMobil, Madam Secretary. We talked a little bit earlier this morning about the uh, cybersecurity uh, information sharing and collaboration program. Uh, and I just wanted to acknowledge that, again, that uh, from our perspective, that program is critical. It's working well. It gives us an opportunity to work closely with DHS uh, uh, personnel and understand what their needs are so that they can understand our needs. Uh, taking that just one step further to a point you made earlier about the fact that beyond the domestic uh, homeland security, you deal internationally. Uh, is there an opportunity to take a program like that and share it in other parts of the world so that uh, we have the same opportunities as uh, organizations and as a country to learn what's going on and have those types of information sharing communications that are so important? Yeah, I think there is. Uh, I think uh, exchanging information, sharing best practices, whatever you want to call it, we can do it bilaterally, we can do it multilaterally. Uh, there have been uh, sessions already uh, with uh, our EU partners uh, on doing exactly that. Uh, one interesting aspect, though, that you raise, and I, and I think we better pursue this, is those have not necessarily included the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, or the critical infrastructure mm -hmm. sectors there. So uh, kind of expanding the aperture to, to do that would make sense. So in uh, our last few minutes, um, thank you all for very uh, important questions. Uh, Secretary Napolitano, as you contemplate your future at the Homeland Department, and speaking for me, I'm delighted that you've indicated you are staying, uh, and you uh, think about some of the unfinished business. Uh, what are, just give you the opportunity to close, but also perhaps to let us know what your highest priorities are gonna be in the next month to year. I think uh, when, when I look at where I'm gonna be spending my time, uh, aside from kind of the, the management uh, integration type, type issues, uh, I think uh, the coming immigration debate is something that uh, we are going to be deeply involved in, and we have deep and wide experience uh, in those issues. Uh, cyber, uh, we have already mentioned. Uh, and then uh, the constantly evolving types of uh, terrorist threats uh, and how we can uh, better uh, educate ourselves, train law enforcement, uh, ascertain from uh, history and otherwise what are what are better ways to identify behaviors and indicators of, of potential violence um, those are the things that are going to concern me and as I was mentioning uh, just now when you think about uh, the issues confronting the country and, and there are many uh, but uh, those are three central ones uh, and we now have created this huge asset you know it's a homeland security department that integrates what previously had been 22 different entities with different home agencies and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and now we're not just about connecting the dots, we're about finding the patterns and about really uh, analyzing what are the dangers to the security of the people of the United States, uh, what are the highest ones, uh, what are uh, the ones that are uh, best managed now, better managed now. Um manage the second decade after 9-11? I think there are some important questions still to ask. That's right. you know, what are our values and are we getting it right? And these are questions that, that many of you think about. We will have uh, more national conversations on these issues. We're very grateful, um, Janet, that you came here. This is your first, so far as I know, sort of look out on the horizon speech uh, in this calendar year. Obviously That's your right. first one since the second term of President Obama began. That was just this week, but hey. Uh, but we're honored by your presence and, and uh, uh, following this, uh, the, the closing of this session, we're moving to our advisory group That's where right. you will spend time with us talking about these and other issues. Um, to everyone, uh, thank you for being thoughtful. Thank you for uh, being in the policy debate, and thank you for coming to the Wilson Center. Thank you.